Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar on Building Climate Resilience, the Case of Extreme Heat. Before addressing the main topic, I want to start with Stanford's land acknowledgement. Stanford sits on the ancestral land of the Mwekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. This is the first of a new series of webinars examining how climate change driven extreme events exacerbate inequality. I'm excited that we'll be joined today by Noah Diffenbaugh, Aide Guzman, and Herberto Fernandez. I'm Chris Field, director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, the organizer for today's event. The Woods Institute has been for nearly 20 years Stanford's marquee investment in advancing understanding and developing practical solutions to our era's pressing environmental problems. Wood scholars team with other researchers, governments, companies, and NGOs to build bridges from research to action to adjust challenges in climate, health, food, water, oceans, and biodiversity. Looking forward, we in the Woods Institute are excited to be working with colleagues from across the university as a founding pillar in the bold new Stanford Door School of Sustainability. And progress on the new school is breathtaking, with a recent appointment of Arun Majundar as the founding dean and the official opening just a few weeks away on September 1st. Today's session is part of a series on climate extremes and inequality. Future sessions will focus on wildfire, drought, heavy precipitation, and hurricanes. And please check the Woods website for information on these and other upcoming events related to climate and sustainability. In many ways, the topic of heat and why it's a problem needs little introduction. When I led the work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change on managing the risks of extreme events and disasters, that was now more than 10 years ago, it was already clear that warming is increasing the frequency and severity of heat waves and that risks to people, ecosystems, and infrastructure rise dramatically with each increment of warming. In the last few months, we've seen punishing heat waves around the world, including the highest temperatures ever recorded in Great Britain, the warmest month on record in India, and the day before yesterday, the highest recorded temperature ever in Portland, Oregon. We're even seeing brief periods of temperatures and humidity so high that even healthy humans cannot survive prolonged exposure. We know a lot about the relationship between heat waves and climate warming, and we know a lot about the impacts of historical heat waves, especially for the most vulnerable. But we're now moving into a largely unknown world with unprecedented temperatures, persistence, frequency, and distribution. For the foreseeable future, we'll need to live with heat and we need to be smart about the way we do it. For the next segment of today's webinar, we'll turn to three experts in the causes and consequences of brutal heat. Heidi Guzman is an NSF and UC Chancellor's postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at UC Irvine. Previously, she completed her PhD in the Department of Environmental Science, Policy, and Management at UC Berkeley. IDA studies agroecological approaches that could harness biodiversity and ecosystem functioning for improved agricultural resilience. Through her work, she aims to support farmers, especially those who are historically underserved, through research, education, and outreach that builds on their innovations and demonstrates ecological pathways to agricultural resilience. Herberto Fernandez is a proud son of farm workers and a former child farm worker himself, who now serves as UFW Foundation's Government Affairs Deputy Director. The UFW Foundation has for 15 years mobilized farm workers around the country to advocate for more equitable policies such as immigration reform, pesticide protections, stronger heat illness prevention standards, hazard pay, and other worker protections. Roberto specializes in legislative and electoral campaigns, worker mobilization, participatory education, and workers' rights policy. In just one week, Roberto was organizing a march of California farm workers from Delano to Sacramento to urge Governor Gavin Newsom to sign AB 2183, the UFW Ag Labor Relations Voting Choice Act. Noah Diffenbaugh is the Kara J. Foundation Professor and Kimmelman Family Senior Fellow at Stanford, where he studies climate dynamics and impacts, especially impacts related to extreme events. Noah is best known for breakthrough research on extreme event attribution, on the 2011 to 2017 California drought, and on the economic impacts of climate change. 
No is the editor of Future Earth, lead author on the Intergovernmental Panel uh, on Climate Change, and he testifies frequently before federal, state, and local officials, and utilizes a wide range of channels for communicating to the public. His work has been recognized with many awards, including election as a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and a Cavalry Fellow of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. The, the format for the next segment of today's webinar is that I'll start with a few questions. After about 20 minutes, we'll get to the good part, questions from all of you in the audience. To get a question into the queue, type it at any point into the Q&A box using the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many of the questions as we can, and after the conversation, we'll draft answers to any unanswered questions and post them on the, on the Woods website. Let me start with the first question to, to Noah, and maybe you can help us understand the um, a little more about the causes of the of the heat waves we're seeing. Are these are these really just a natural outcome of the of the warming we've seen, or are there other climate processes that are amplifying them? Yeah. So uh, as you know, I'm sure uh, most listeners know we've had about 1.1 degrees Celsius of global scale warming above the pre-industrial, um, and you know that's not uniform uh, over. Uh, the whole globe and there's been more warming over land than over the ocean and with so much um you know land in the in the northern hemisphere that has uh you know created greater warming over the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere but um you know very clear warming across the world and the primary uh mechanism by which uh you know global warming is affecting heat waves is is what, what the scientific jargon calls the thermodynamic influences and this is just if you imagine um you know everything getting warmer then the hottest events uh will also get warmer so that's that's the primary mechanism but it's become clear especially in the last decade that that's not the only mechanism um and there's been a you know a, a, a long series of papers now by a number of different research groups uh including work from from our group here at Stanford uh showing that there are changes in the uh frequency of uh the kinds of atmospheric patterns that uh create heat waves um and you know these are these are the kinds of of pressure patterns that that, that we're all familiar with seeing in the in the weather forecast the kinds of, of patterns that create heat waves these are happening um you know, they're creating more severe heat when they do happen and then the the second component, and I want to acknowledge uh, Deepti Singh, who completed her PhD here um, several years ago now, and is now a professor at Washington State University. Deepti's group has recently done some really pioneering work showing that concurrent heat waves are increasing around the world. So the kinds of events that we've seen this summer and in previous summers, it's not just our imagination or the effect of social media or conventional media sort of giving us awareness that it's hot in lots of different places at once. It's actually true. Uh, you know, we, we know from Deepi's work and, and the work of others that uh, that these concurrent heat waves are, are happening more frequently as a result, both of it getting warmer in lots of different places and uh, that that uh, these these patterns are, are tending to, to produce more severe heat waves more frequently. I want to stick with this just for, for one more uh, question before we, we move on to the others. Uh, one of the things I'm hearing is that uh, climate science either sort of got it right or got it wrong on, on how many heat waves we're seeing. And my, my reading of the IPCC special report on extremes, which was 2011, is that this is pretty much exactly what we would expect with, with um, some kinds of amplifications that that you've described that we didn't necessarily know about at the time, but with the expectation that a small amount of warming leads to a big increase in the abundance and the severity of heat waves. Is it, you think that's a fair characterization? Yeah, I really agree with that, Chris. Um, and, and I think, you know, the thing is, is that now, you know, the climate science community has been publishing future projections for long enough that we can go back and <laughs> now those future projections are, are starting to become the past. Um, and we've done that, you know, we, we can go back and just look anecdotally, but we can also go back and look um, systematically. And and your assessment is, is exactly correct. Um, I, I will say that, um, 
and I think it's very relevant for for the topic of the panel today. Mm -hmm. I was asked in class um, winter quarter what I'd gotten most wrong in my career, and um, you know, as all aside the, from signing up to do this webinar. Yeah, no, this is yeah, this is this has been the best choice all summer for sure. Um, but you know, I used to be a real adaptation optimist, and I, I really. Um, you know, a, a decade ago, when I was, you know, publishing those those projections that are now becoming the past, um, I, I really was was optimistic that that by investing in economic development, investing in human development, uh, that we could you know, generate the resources that would, you know, the adaptation would would follow along, and you know what. I was wrong about that, and and what I you know has become really clear is that the gap between what was predicted and what's happening. The question you're asking about whether we got it wrong that gap's pretty small, as you're saying, but the gap between what's happening and what we're prepared for is is really big, and it's getting bigger. And I think that's that's just you know fa factually true, not not based just on the anecdotes we're experiencing, but you know I think we're seeing that that gap get wider and wider. Yeah, super important observation and, and a really uh, natural turning point to begin to think about the impacts of the heat waves. And, and Roberta, you, you represent a, a group of people who uh, need to work outside. And, and I wonder if you could just characterize for us how, to, how in the farm work community, people think about um, risk from heat, dealing with it, and, and how to align the... the the need to be productive with uh, this increasing severity of the environmental challenges. Chris, well, I you know I can share from personal experience, the experience of my parents who are career farm workers, who in the Central Valley to this day, where it's over a hundred degrees, they are uh, working in the grape industry, the table grape industry. Um, you know, they're, and I, I and this is a. Uh, also true of many of our members who call us every day worried that um, you know that their employers aren't providing enough right they're not providing enough water shade they're not encouraging breaks they're not giving people the adequate protection that they need to be able to endure eight ten hours in the fields and so um, you know it really is, I mean heat is the leading weather related killer for farm workers. Um, and it's gotten worse and worse over the past 19, 20 years. And uh, farm workers are very aware that heat can also cause heat stroke and uh, death, mm. really, if it's not treated properly or if the symptoms aren't addressed properly. And unfortunately, in agriculture, farm workers um, experience many barriers to proper attention when they do feel symptoms. Um, it wasn't too long ago where um, in Lodi, in a farm near Lodi, um, uh, there was a case where a young woman, was, um, her name is Maria Isabel Vasquez Jimenez, and this was in 2008. Um, she was tying grapevines um, out of Stockton near Lodi when the temperatures soared way above 95 degrees. And uh, Maria Isabel was um, experiencing very classic symptoms of heat exhaustion. Well, you know, she, when she asked, when she told the employer, her boss at the, at the time, that she was feeling ill, the boss said, well, sit it out in the car. Um, and um, instead of taking her to the hospital, they asked her to sit it out. Um, uh, the, her boyfriend at the time, um, you know, decided to stop working and instead of sitting it out, took her to the hospital. Well, by the time she got to the hospital, her body um, temperature topped over 108 degrees and Marisabel died two days later. Um, we later learned that she was two months pregnant at the time. And so um, since her death, her family had become really involved with the United Farm Workers. Um, and UFW Foundation, we advocated to pass California's most stringent heat protections in California. In fact, we sued the state of California. 
And today, California's heat standards uh, have been now renamed Maria Isabel Vasquez Jimenez, Jimenez Heat Illness Prevention Regulation. And her story, unfortunately, is not unique to her. And it's um, a story that um, many people among the farm working community are very aware about um, because it, it's, it's not, it wasn't an isolated incident. And this happens in many places. And because of the nature of agriculture, they're rural, they're very, uh, many times the nearest hospital or the nearest clinic is miles and miles away. Um, you know, heat and the increasing impacts of heat, uh, uh, increasing uh, heat temperatures really does pose a life-threatening risk to farm workers. And everywhere. can you comment on the effectiveness of the new regulations in California and whether they're moving the needle in terms of protecting farm workers? You know, like I mentioned, there's a, a severe, short, I mean, there's just, there's a lot of underreporting. Um, and the many barriers to underreporting um, determine whether or not a farm worker reaches out to a state agency for help, or if they are, um, you know, filing a complaint on their boss. Um, many of the state agencies, well, the state agency that's in charge here in California of ensuring that farm workers have adequate safety heat protections, Cal OSHA, um, for many reasons that agriculture is um, one where they're seeing less uh, cases filed. Uh, there's, it's either because of poor agency outreach, um, maybe they're understaffed, which we know they are severely understaffed in California. In fact, we know they are, or it's just plain indifference. Um, there's also a lot of issues that we've heard um, in terms of language barriers. Uh, uh, not limited to Spanish because a lot of farm workers also speak many native, native languages. And, and real plain and simple, because farm workers, most of whom are undocumented, they have a real fear of the authorities and of these, and these agencies, as well intended, intended as they are, uh, also become you know, the authorities. So underreporting um, is a big, is a big issue. Also, clinicians, a lot of doctors oftentimes misdiagnose heat illness as a heart attack, or they misdiagnose heat illness for something else. And, um, you know, farm workers don't, are oftentimes, mis, you know, they don't get treated adequately. And so, in many ways, no. the farm worker heat exposure, kind of a perfect storm of uh, inequality and the environmental stress is really amplifying each other and and really producing a mandate for, for additional actions. Right. I, 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 you, you think more about um, small farmers who are trying to use innovative practices in order to have sustainable livelihoods. And from the, from the farmer, uh, farm manager, small farm manager perspective. And how does your community think about the stresses that are imposed by extreme heat? Yeah, um, well, I just, I'm sitting with, with everything that Iberto shared, which I'm, uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that really moved me. And so I, yeah, I work with small farms in the Central Valley um, and you know, I grew up in the Central Valley and it's hot there. You know, some of the most like the record breaking uh, temperatures have been within the last five years. I think the record for over a hundred degrees, um, the, re the record number of a hundred degree days, uh, over a hundred degree days was 69. And that was last year. And then um, I recently checked in with the farmer, um, you know, just calling to see how they were doing. And I asked him, I was like, hey, how's it going? He's like, well, you know, um, just here with the heat. And so it was kind of really, ironic that like it was right before uh this webinar and he tells me you know we've had uh two weeks you know already of over 100 degrees and it's projected to be another 100 degrees and you know I work with some uh farms and you know a lot of the farms in the Central Valley tend to be really large right but I work with uh farmers who are sm farming at a much smaller scale and most of them tend to be immigrant refugees mostly Mexican, farm, people who used to be farm workers who are now farming their um, own piece of land, and then uh, refugees predominantly among uh, farmers. And one of the ways that heat uh, affects them is, you know, 
physiologically probably every farmer um, on like a physiological level, crops are ripening faster, right? Which then leads to, you know, bigger pressures uh, for, you know, harvesting, which Heriberto can probably touch on more and sort of all those colliding effects of heat and higher production levels. But then at the other end, um, it means that they might might have to harvest sooner. And so a lot of the farmers that I work with saw the farmers markets. And in fact, farmers markets that are in the Bay Area or even in SoCal. And so usually what they do is they harvest on Thursdays and Fridays. Um, but it means that sometimes now they have to harvest on Mondays and Tuesdays. And so um, they harvest on Thursdays and Fridays so they can they drive, which is usually really early in the morning, drive several hours out to the Bay or SoCal. But if they're harvesting Monday and Tuesdays, it means like, what do they do with that produce, especially in this heat? And a lot of these farms are farming at such a small scale that they don't have the infrastructure built up where they have coolers and refrigerators and these warehouses to be able to store um, you know, these crops. And so um, one thing that has been happening is that you know, they're harvesting, they need to harvest earlier, but then they don't have anywhere to store a lot of the produce. And so that leads to food waste, it leads to, um, you know, um, and I don't want to fixate completely on the idea of having access to coolers, but I think it's an example of sort of the resource imbalance that um, impacts uh, some of the small farms who have less resources in the area. And yeah. And we do often hear that a uh, vast majority of Americans have access to air conditioning and the, that the, the primary strategy for dealing with heat is um, to make sure that people have access to cooling centers, but that really doesn't work for the community of farmers and ag workers that we're talking about here, does it? Let me uh, ask a, a little more about kind of the- Chris, uh, if, if I may add, just, oh, sure. you know, just recently this year, we learned that there was a blueberry company out of Kern County who notified their employees that they will not be operating this year because of changes in climate. And they shut down operations because of the temperatures and see what AD described, the, the produce was not uh, adequate for harvesting. And so that we're seeing that more and more in agriculture and our, and our workers, unfortunately, are the ones that are also paying the price in addition to the farmers. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's been a lot of work on climate and suitability for crops. And, and we really are seeing yield decreases in many important commodity crops, as well as rain shifts that make it more difficult to grow some of the crops that are economically most important. Yeah, and I think one thing with uh, the small farms I work with is that, you know, it's impacted yield. So it might ripen faster, but then production, like it might be less yields. And so one thing I was talking to, um, a colleague of mine who runs a food hub um, specifically for BIPOC farmers in Fresno. And one thing he mentioned is, and along with another farmer is that, so there was less yield, so there was a higher demand for this produce, a higher price. But then the small farms, you know, they're still producing less and they can't really compete and, uh, and be able to sell their crops. But these larger farms are able to sell at those high prices beating out some of the small farms. So it's creating, you know, you know, you talk about heat and just at the physiological level of the crops, but like Heriberto affects people who are seeking work and then also um, small farms who need to sell their produce. I, I want to dig a little deeper into what these heat waves look like, Noah. And, you, you know, when we, when we think about the uh, stresses on people and, and economies and infrastructure from heat, uh, sometimes it's the maximum temperature that makes a difference. Sometimes it's whether it cools down at night. Sometimes it's how long the heat wave lasts. And, and are, there, are there important features of the recent heat waves we've seen around the world that are kind of changing the boundaries of, of how we think about the stresses from heat? Well, I think certainly, um, you know, the the effect of that incremental warming on the frequency of unprecedented heat is is really a key component of that that um, that we're, we're seeing you know, all around the world uh, that the odds of heat that falls outside of our historical experience it's more extreme than our historical experience uh, are going up and what that means is that uh, the baseline 
um, infrastructure and uh, practices, practices for disaster preparedness and response, practices for public health, practices for agriculture, you know, those are more frequently being exceeded. And that's, that's a, a key challenge. And it's true of the daily maximum temperature in terms of how, how hot it gets uh, at the hottest. It's true of successive days of a very high temperature. Um, it, it's true of the, of the nighttime temperatures. And, and as you alluded to, when we've, when we've seen these uh, very high morbidity and mortality events, uh, it's very often been linked with high nighttime temperatures. The, the absence of cooling off <laughs> during, during the night is a, is a real risk factor um, for, for heat illness and death, but also for um, you know, workplace injuries. And that's something that's new um, in terms of the, the, the literature. Uh, I'm sure not, not new in, in lived experience, but new in the literature just in the last uh, year or so is a really clear documentation that uh, overall workplace injuries are elevated by, uh, by hot conditions. And, and that's addressing some of the gap in how uh, morbidity and mortality are are getting coded. Um, so I think that the um, you know a clear risk factor is is that that the incremental warming is pushing uh, the the events outside of what local uh, you know all, all of the you know the local adaptation to to the historical conditions what that's prepared for and we and we've certainly seen it in recent events where um, you know, where we have conditions in the UK, for example, in, in the most recent heat wave where you know, the absolute temperatures, uh, you know, would not have been record setting, um, you know, even here in the Bay Area, and yet the capacity to withstand those temperatures, uh, you know, was, was uh, severely exceeded. And I'd like to stick with this topic of the unprecedented heat extremes. And Herberto, maybe, maybe you could comment on how, when you think about advocacy for worker protections, how you conceptualize, how you argue for protections to climatic conditions that we've never seen before that are, that are uh, more extreme, more frequent than, than anything in the record. And what's the, how do you make the case that we really need to double down on our commitment to these adaptations. Yeah, I mean, it's important to recognize that there is currently no federal heat standard at, that protects home workers from extreme heat. Um, the Biden administration um, has begun the process of drafting a national heat standard, but it's, it's, it's mind boggling to think that at this stage in, um, increasing impacts of climate change, we still don't have a federal standard that, that ensures that farm workers and any every outdoor worker has uh, meaningful heat protections at the workplace. And, um, you know, there are so many much needed rules for mandatory uh, breaks for people, right? Mandatory water, mandatory shade. Um, and we're, you know, when, we, when we're lobbying, Congress or stronger protections, we're using real life, you know, examples that we're hearing from the ground. Um, farm workers working in the in wildfire conditions, where smoke, uh, where they're breathing smoke, you know, at, as they're almost obligated to work because of the pop the cycle of poverty that they live in, uh, where farm workers aren't provided enough protective equipment. Um, to cover themselves from from the smoke, or even you know the protective equipment itself acts as a uh, it can cause uh, heat stress, right? Mm -hmm. So there's just a lot. Um, you know, we take you know from real store real life examples, and we bring that to Congress, we bring that to the legislature. Um, states are taking their you know they're taking measures um, mm -hmm. independent of the federal government. Uh, but we need a national federal heat standard that protects workers across the country. Yeah, a, a super compelling case. And, and the, the evidence for the role of 
economic inequality and increasing vulnerabilities is so profound in this example. And I, I wonder if you can speak more to the, to the way that the overall status of, of farmers and, and farm workers you know, accentuates vulnerability and whether you're seeing strategies that, that are beginning to be deployed to, to help address the vulnerability. Yeah, um, I guess, you know, we can, we can discuss a lot of things about, I mean, it's caused a cascading number of effects from, you know, um, especially small farms, even, you know, having access to more water, but, you know, that's not going to, you know, digging deeper wells is not going to solve a lot of the issues. And even um, a lot of the small farms, you know, the farmers don't, um, you know, they work on the farms themselves. And so, um, you know, they have to wake up a lot earlier to get out there, but then it gets too hot and then they have to come back in the evening to work again. Um, and so that's causing an impact on, you know, their own livelihood, their own um, work. And I guess the, in terms of like thinking about solutions, um, there's a really great report by um, Dr. Jose Pablo Ortiz Partida, part of the Union of Con Concerned Scientists, UC Merced and CSU Fresno. And I think they really detail some really, you know, just at the greater level thinking about farmers and climate change and especially in California. And I think part of it is trying to think about, um, you know, how do we farm the land to begin with and how do we repurpose land that is going to not be, be able to be farmed anymore? Um, and then also, um, you know, as, assess, um, addressing the issue of having um, farmers being access to coolers, right? Like, which seems like a, a trivial thing, but yeah. Terrific, thank you. I, yeah, um, I'd like to turn to questions from the audience after just a, a couple more questions from, from me. And, and I'm curious, Noah, if you can help us create a slightly broader context for heat and in particular, I wonder if you can speak to the way that that the impact of climate change on on heat, drought, and wildfire smoke is um, interacting in a in a way that that makes the problem a lot more complicated than it would otherwise be. Uh, yeah, so I, I uh, you know, we're focusing on heat in this in this first discussion of the series, and it's a really appropriate uh, place to start. And as we'll see. Uh, you know, throughout the series of, uh, of webinars on this on this topic, you know, heat is really um, has its fingerprints on on so many extreme events and and so many extreme events that are uh, that are important for this discussion in terms of water resources. Um, you know, heat is a real amplifier of uh, water deficits. Drought, uh, you know, in our in the Western U.S. and and, and in California in particular, our reliance on snowpack. Uh, for both flood control and water storage, uh, you know, is really being hampered by uh, long-term warming in exactly the way that was predicted uh, back in the 80s. Um, in terms of uh, you know, ecosystem, uh, risk for ecosystems, as, as uh, you, you're much more expert than I am, Chris, uh, you know, it's a real, um, a real stressor for for ecosystems, both terrestrial ecosystems, riparian ecosystems, marine ecosystems, increasingly becoming more and more clear with marine heat waves, um, including off the coast of California here. Um, in terms of air quality, there are a couple pathways by which uh, heat uh, impacts air quality. Um, you know, just the, the chemical reactions in the atmosphere is number one, and that's been you know well understood for a long time, and we're certainly seeing that play out with with global warming. Uh, heat is a uh, big uh, risk um, risk factor for wildfires, drying out the vegetation, um, and then uh, that's clearly leading to, to increased prevalence of, of smoke events uh, here in the western U.S., so that's, that's pathway. And then also with um, the atmospheric circulation, so we, we have clear evidence, uh, including from work uh, by uh, Dan Horton, who was a uh, postdoc here um, at Stanford is now on the faculty at, at Northwestern, showing that uh, you know global warming uh, in these, particularly in these mid-latitude regions, uh, really enhances the the kinds of atmospheric circulation that that produce stagnant air masses and and poor air quality, and those incidentally are also um, 
you know, related to the kinds of air masses that produce heat waves and, and elevate wildfire risk. So they're, as you're alluding to, they're, they're intimately interconnected physically and, and uh, we're certainly experiencing increasing frequency of these compound conditions, both locally in a given area or region and also globally uh, we're, you know, along the lines of what we were discussing earlier with these uh, concurrent heat waves, we're also experiencing these compound uh, hot, dry conditions simultaneously in, in, in different areas around the world that actually, you know, in terms of the global food system are, you know, we've, we've really built a global food system that's, that's been dependent on, on uh, not having those concurrent shocks and, and we're experiencing those concurrent shocks much more frequently. Yeah, su super important to, to think about the compound events as we, as we try and put solutions in place. Uh, the, currently, we have 28 questions in the Q&A box, and I, I apologize in advance that we're not going to get to all of them. But, but let me start with some questions that do kind of uh, lean us in the direction of asking what the solutions might look like. And here's one from Elena Bashkova. It's a question for Herberto. What sort of measures can be put in place to encourage workers to report breaches of their rights regarding breaks from work and physical protection against deep et etc.? Also, are there currently laws or legislation in place in the U.S. or in other countries that assert more workers' rights during heat waves? Well, I think there's a lot. There are a lot of new, innovative ideas coming out of the state. Uh, the uh, treasurer, I'm sorry, the California State uh, Controller, um, it just issued a proposal to figure out a way to create incentives for towns to uh, have uh, like certain insurance measures. Um, I, I'm not very clear about that yet, but I know that there's something happening in the state legislature currently that is trying to address how farm workers and how people in the community can um, sort of insure themselves from the height the impacts of climate change um you know they're just very simple things uh, that wouldn't help farm workers file complaints you know having um in, in fully staffing a department is one um having um staff that are bilingual or you know even trilingual in some cases <laughs> speaking to the different languages that are out there in the community um but really there's a real i mean uh, the underpinning issue in terms of why people don't file complaints is this imbalance of power when workers feel so powerless uh, or are fearful of retaliation or being blacklisted in, from their job because they do file complaints. I mean, that those are real, real um, uh, barriers for why workers don't file a complaint because of the imbalance of power. So for us, ensuring that farm workers have a voice on the job Collective bargaining is one way to do that, is what we're really trying to uplift in farm workers uh, and the communities that we, we are uh, talking to is, you know, through collective bargaining, they can have a real process, a real mechanism by which they can address their grievances and maybe even come up with real solutions um, farm to farm. And, and as is so important for addressing inequality, the, the solutions have to in, involve the participation of the whole society, including the farm workers from the start. And I think that's the, the key message that you're providing is that, that the, the workers actually know what kinds of things are needed and, uh, and having them in the conversation is, is the key to making progress. Right. Um, let, let me turn to, uh, to a, a, a question that's uh, also in the in the uh, in the uh, area of whether we're looking at future successes. This one's from William Liggett, and, and anybody can take a stab at answering this one. Given the problems you describe, are there any successful and promising activities that have already been undertaken to address them? I know some of the things we hear about are, are things like uh, shifting worker hours and, and uh, provision of, of shade and cooling stations. And I know there has been in some progress. And Roberto, would you, would you characterize that as, as getting us 10% of the way we need to go or are we, 
we sort of oh, yeah. getting far enough along that we can see what works and what doesn't. We are seeing, um, I mean, we are seeing some success and we should always celebrate success when we see it. Um, 10 years ago, you wouldn't see shade in the fields. Now they have shade structures that cover, um, you know, uh, these are trailer hitches that are connected to a truck and the trailer acts that doubles as shade and as a lunch area for farm workers to sit in. 10 years ago, you would never see this. Um, and that's because of the advocacy and because, of, you know, the state has been paying attention to all of the, you know, the, the grievances that we presented to them, that now we see shade in almost every field. Um, uh, we're seeing more compliance, um, but there needs to be more outreach. There needs to be more enforcement. Um, when there's no enforcement, then sometimes the employers feel like they're, you know, they're, the, 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 there's no, uh, you know, the, the law is the, that they're above the law sometimes. And so we want to make sure that the state is also in, enforcing the law by filing complaint, by, by filing uh, fines, by going out into the fields, talking to workers, talking to employers. We need more of that, but certainly we have seen improvements in uh, the attitude that employers are taking in terms of how why they should be protecting their workforce uh, from the conditions from high heat conditions. And, and Aide, can you, can you speak to any changes that you're seeing farmers make that are moving things in the right direction? Yeah, I guess well, one thing I think about is that, you know, without doubt, you know, heat, heat waves and droughts are going to affect uh, some of the most um, disproportionately affected and marginalized communities. And um, and I think one thing I see like with uh, the work that I do and the farmers that I work with is that, um, you know, we can focus on all these, you know, negative impacts that, uh, you know, the environment that these heat waves drought is causing. Um, but in, the, in, in working with these farmers, a lot of these farmers are implementing regenerative agricultural practices. And I actually see these farms as like an opportunity of hope of transforming this agricultural landscape. Um, and bringing back, you know, life in a, a very different direction to um, the Central Valley. And so, um, you know, on one end, you know, they are being disproportionately affected by some of these, um, you know, uh, you know, issues with the climate crisis. But on the other end, I think they also offer the opportunity and moving forward. And so um, there has been some really good investments uh, over the past year. Uh, for example, um, there's been some uh, positions created around climate and equity focused extension advisors and also funds towards more uh, technical assistance. Um, I think I froze. And then also there's, um, you know, there's our community organizers, like for example, the California Farmer Justice Collaborative who have passed, you know, legislation to uh, support uh, farmers who um, quote unquote, according to the, the political terms, socially disadvantaged. Um, so there is progress. And so for me, I see uh, small farms, especially those who are incorporating some regenerative practices can counter some of the climate impacts or sort of push agriculture to a different direction in the Central Valley. And, and let me turn to another question that kind of is more about the biogeophysical implications of the kinds of things you're talking about. This one probably for Noah, questions from Alan Chin. And, and the question is, would increasing the size of forests and widespread implementation of green rooftops in, in cities help mitigate extreme heat events? How much, how much should we change the environment in order to, to decrease the frequency or severity of these events? Yeah, that's a great question. And I know one, uh, Chris, your research group has worked on as well. Um, we do know a lot about um, local, you know, local surface energy balance to use the, the jargon, sorry, but just basically what, what uh, you know, sort of, um, influences the, the local conditions. And you know, there certainly are opportunities. And something I'm interested in, in the California context, where we have very um, clear and ambitious uh, climate mitigation goals in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions, how we can you know, bring that specificity and ambition into adaptation, and in particular, create synergies. Um, so certainly, I think the you know the the green rooftops and um, also you know painting painting rooftops white has also been a lot of you know to increase the reflectivity been a lot of work on that but in general decreasing the urban heat island effect 
that has double benefits because it it decreases the um, decreases the local uh, extreme heat and also decreases the need for air conditioning, which is um, you know in the current energy system a <laughs> uh, source of greenhouse gas emissions. And then I'll also note that uh, you know we we've had a lot of um, another area where we've had. Uh, a lot of new research in the last decade that I'm sure is not new for the lived experience, uh, but but very clearly there's a lot of um, inequality within urban areas in terms of both exposure and vulnerability to extreme heat, and that's now very clearly documented through multiple lines of evidence. And so that's another area where the where the the the, um, so the solutions described in the question can help to. Um, decrease the the unequal impacts of, of of severe heat especially if those solutions are targeted through that lens and and this is especially important because these local scale effects of differences in vegetation and the amount of concrete and the amount of direct sun exposure can really lead to big differences in temperature and big differences in the in the level of risk for humans um let me let me swing back to the one question about the interactive effects. This one's for Ida, I think, it, um, and it, it um, was from Hannah Doris. It says, I, "I'm not sure if the same UCS report that that Ida is referring to, but um, the the uh, conclusion was that pesticides become more dangerous when heat is over five, 85 degrees." Uh, can you comment on this? And do you do you feel that in general, um, chemical exposure is something that we should be putting more and more emphasis on when we think about uh, working under high heat conditions. Yeah, I think the one of the pieces, if I'm remembering correctly, but maybe Roberto can uh, speak more on the pesticide exposure, um, but is, you know, with, you know, greater well drilling, it's going to cause uh, shifts in um, leaching of pesticides and nitrates, which then can lead to uh, um, exposure um, beyond just the farm. Um, and in, fa in fact, you know, the areas, uh, there's always been issues around water contamination. And, you know, like an anecdote, like I was very excited to be able to drink tap water in um, when I went to uh, school and to college, because growing up, it wasn't a thing you're supposed to do. And in fact, you know, warned against and now uh, where my mom lives now you're not supposed to at all drink out of the top water but um maybe Roberto can speak more on sort of the pesticide exposure at the farm worker level well Roberto comments on that yeah you know I recently learned this and I, I was um, kind of shocked that I didn't know this before but uh, on pesticides you know pesticides are only effective if they are sprayed within a certain climate and for some pesticides the pesticide becomes is only effective if it's if it's sprayed when the temperature is 85 degrees and below. And what happens is, you know, some farmers choose not to spray that pesticide, or they choose to spray even stronger pesticides, more deadly <laughs> toxic pesticides, so that they are uh, heat uh, resistant. And with that, well, you know what that means. It means that we're now being, you know. Now, because of climate change and because of increases in heat, we're now um, eating fruits and vegetables that are sprayed with more toxic substances. And so that's just one you know, food for thought that I, I recently learned. And I learned this from, not from a, a, any study, I learned this from my, my father-in-law who, who is a chemical applicator uh, out of Kern County. And that to me was just mind boggling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super, super interesting. And I'm sure that the person who's got their hand on the lever controlling the amount of pesticides is the person who knows the answer. Yeah. Um, let, let, let me ask a question that, that relates to the intersection between the yields of high temperature on crops and, and these worker issues we've been talking about. This one's from our faculty colleague, John Wyant, um, probably for Noah. Do crop models underestimate climate change impacts on crop productivity because they, they're not generally including the link between the heat effects and the um, on the crop and the heat effects on the worker productivity? Yeah, I think that's that's a, a great question. I can um, 
I can imagine the uh, cranks uh, in in John's thinking uh, where that's where that's headed uh, for your work, John. Um, and you know, certainly there's uh, you know huge amount of work on you know the empirical studies of yields pioneered by uh, David Bobel and, and and Chris uh, here at Stanford. Um, and then, uh, you know, in terms of the mechanistic models, the AGMIP uh, type models that people might be familiar with, John, I know you are, um, you know, that I, I'm not aware of, of the, you know, worker productivity being in, in, included in that, uh, you know, in those mechanistic models. Um, Marshall Burke and Francis Davenport and I had a paper last year on, you know, analyzing the crop insurance program, the U.S. crop insurance program and the losses, uh, insured losses, indemnities paid out of that program and the relationships with, with severe heat. Um, so there again, you know, depend, you know, those claims are mostly crop damage claims. Um, and, and so I think not reflected there either. You know, we, we estimated, you know, on the order of a billion dollars a year uh, over the last three decades uh, from increasing temperature so just the just the warming effects but again i think those are not um but that's not a full accounting by any means that's simply through the through through the indemnities in the in the crop insurance programs so you know i i think it's a i think it's a great question and certainly um one where we're we're becoming increasingly aware uh again in in the research community um of the sort of full footprint of of uh, these impacts, and um, you know, I, I think that uh, in general, what we found is that um, you know where where the impacts assessments have been, um, uh, where there, you know, if anything, that we we we've been conservative, uh, and that's that's partly from the general posture of the research community being inherently conservative, and also from uh, you know, these fuller effects, uh, you know, taking time to, to reveal themselves, um, again, in the research community, not in the lived experience. You tend to know a lot more about the simple, uh, not simple, but the direct effects rather than about these compound effects. And as the, as the window on the importance of the compound effects opens up, there's a, a real need for more research. John, we should, we should talk about how we might address this in, in future studies. Um, here's a question about kind of uh, an alternative to, to worker protection. Let me ask it to Eroberto. This is from uh, someone who I, I didn't get the name of. Uh, but the question is, cooling centers don't really work uh, for working people and poor solution. Is um, increasing interest in automating farming with robotics and machines something, a good thing in the case of risk to worker health? How, how do you think about that? It's a slippery slope. Um, I mean, it's a it's a double edged sword sort of thing, right? Where, on the one hand, you are mitigating risk, but on the other hand, mechanization leads to job loss, and those are two real things that you know we're we're seeing uh, a lot of interest in on behalf of the agribusiness community. They want it more and more. They're interested in figuring out how do we mechanize a lot of these uh, harvesting practices. Um, it it's a double edged sword again, you know. Farm workers will, will endure as much as they can in the heat, and they will do so because of the cycle of poverty that they live in. Um, and um, I think we, it, we we need to look at um, alternatives that are able to preserve people's jobs and livelihoods. Yeah, and just like a small addition. Please, like, yeah. Yeah, with the mechanization of, you know, and technology, um, it can also lead to, you know, consolidation of like farmland of like who's the owner at some levels um but yeah like Eriberto said it's like a slippery slope you know there's some really exciting pieces to ag technology and mechanization but um it can have some negative consequences and one of those being consolidation of farmland and, and we really ought to think about you know where we do have options for worker protections that are impactful and and where uh integration of technology can can help um, you know, maintain the overall quality of ag, including the worker participation. We're down to um, just time for one or two more questions. 
Uh, let me start with one from um, Michael Frazier, and then anyone can take a shot at this one. Uh, are there better ways to spread the word about best practices for farm owners that help them retain workers, get higher productivity and other economic benefits? Are extension agents helping in this area since they know their local area as well? And um, the, the theme could be that if you accept the new reality of more and hotter days, what can you do and still stay in business? Uh, from the uh, representative of the small farmer perspective, Ida, how, how do you think about those issues? I guess there's like two parts to that question, right? One about, um, you know, are they spreading the word around uh, best practices? And the other piece was around, um, yeah, what was the other piece about? Well, I mean, how, how, do you, how do you cope with the, these conditions yeah. and still have an economically viable operation? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I feel like I, I, people like ask me a lot about like, what are some of the best agricultural practices for, um, especially around like climate adaptation. And, um, and I've gotten, you know, from other colleagues being like, you know, do we need more ecological data to show which practices are better? Um, and I think that's part of the issues that, you know, um, that a lot of the small farms are already doing a lot of these practices. And uh, part of the issue, I think, in terms of, you know, coping with it is uh, understanding who gets to operate the land and who owns the land and who is able to uh, work the land. And so um, farmers are incredibly innovative. Farmers, um, you know, for centuries have been implementing agricultural practices that, you know, can mitigate or counter some of the uh, uh, impacts. Um, but there are, like I mentioned earlier, some extension uh, advisors. There's been funds towards that, uh, specifically around climate um, and equity um, in California. Um, but yeah, I always go back to that. Like, you know, it's, it, we don't need to spread the word more. Maybe we don't even need more ecological data around some of these agricultural practices. Is around, you know, distribution of land and who's operating and who gets to make those decisions. Roberto, comment on this one? Yeah, I, I, um, I second Ida's comments. I'll just say that. I, um, no, I, I won't go further on this. Thank you. Okay. Well, let me let me close it out with a with a question for Noah, and uh, this one uh, from Belinda Ramirez. It says, "What do you think the role of universities like Stanford can be in pushing for?" just legislation regulations around increasing temperatures, for instance, around farm worker labor conditions and, and small scale agriculture. What is our responsibility? Well, I think this, uh, I've learned a ton in this webinar um, and I don't say that to be trite. I think that, you know, what the, what the Woods Institute has been doing, you know, has really uh, created the template for uh, the new Stanford Door School for, uh, you know, engaging in, uh, in solutions uh, relevant um, research and education, and also engaging directly with um, decision makers, stakeholders um, around those solutions, and not just in uh, in terms of uh, us doing research and transmitting our assessment of the solution, but bringing uh, people together who really understand uh, what's needed um, you know, in, in the ways that we've, that we've heard today. And, and so I'm, I'm really excited about uh, you know, Stanford's potential um, and, and with the new school and with, with Woods as the, as the key anchor in, in achieving that. And you know, Stanford's not the only university, and I think we're we're seeing uh, all around the country and and the world a real um, acceleration of of um, these priorities for for universities, and we're seeing it uh, you know most potently from our students, and you know it's more and more every year. Um, you know, I it, it it's earlier and early in the quarter when I uh, am hearing <laughs> from from my class, hey, uh, you know, let's let's get to the solutions. So I, I think I, I think it's it's only going to accelerate. Yeah, a, a really important mandate, and I think today's conversation has really illustrated the the way that that Stanford, other universities, can't do it by themselves. That the role of organizations like the UFW Foundation, uh, outreach to governments, other NGOs, empowering the people is, re is really going to be critical. Yeah. I want to thank uh, again Aide, Guzman, 
uh, Alberto Fernandez and noted from a really fabulous conversation that that's, that's helped us um, peel back what it means for these heat events to be the kind of sharp edge of climate change and, and the effects on inequality to really um, be the, the critical issue that, that needs to be addressed. Thank you, wonderful conversation. Thanks to all of you who submitted questions, including those whose questions we were not able to get to as I, as I indicated earlier, we will post the answers on the website as well as a recording of this video.